Please take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 13. In this chapter, Yeshua is teaching the multitude with parables, stories that illustrate. And it's really important for us to understand how to correctly interpret these parables so that we can learn from each one the point that Yeshua is actually making. A parable is really a, a simple illustration of a simple idea using something familiar to teach something unfamiliar. And in most of them, the parable is making a single point. So we need to be really careful about reading too much into these stories and making doctrines or beliefs out of some of the small details. Now why did Yeshua speak to people in parables? This is something we really need to get a handle on. In verse 11 of chapter 13, Yeshua tells His disciples that the ability to understand the mysteries or the secrets of the kingdom of heaven had been given to them, but not to everyone. He went on in verses 14 and 15 to explain that, generally speaking, the people's heart had grown dull and their eyes and ears were dull and closed spiritually. In other words, they weren't genuinely humbling themselves before God and, and repenting of their sins and seeking His truth and, and receiving Yeshua. All are invited to come to God through Yeshua, but the sad truth is that most don't do it. He says that many are called, but few are chosen. We need to respond to Yeshua's invitation by coming to Him as little children in faith and in trust and in repentance that is characterized by total submission to Him and to His Word, giving God's instructions and commandments authority over our lives. And when we do that, He gives us His Ruach HaKodesh, His Holy Spirit, to dwell within us. And with it, we receive the ability to hear and see and understand spiritual things more clearly. He prepares us to bear fruit for His kingdom, just as a farmer prepares his soil before sowing his seed. But those who do not respond to Him with that kind of faith and humility and repentance will not receive His Holy Spirit or the ability to see and hear and understand spiritual things. And Yeshua's teaching was not meant for people like that. That's why He spoke in parables. Yeshua says in verse 13 that therefore I speak to them in parables because they don't really see or hear or understand. And we might say that one function of the parables was to test the spiritual responsiveness of Yeshua's listeners. To do some spiritual sifting. To awaken their spiritual perception. He wanted those who were being prepared to understand. He sometimes used parables to describe things and communicate ideas that were abstract and harder to understand, and he did this by using parables as illustrations. The sincere seekers who were receptive to spiritual truth and receptive to Yeshua, they would understand his parables and the more difficult concepts that those parables illustrated. But the rest of the people would not. Those who had their spiritual ears and eyes opened by the Holy Spirit would understand. But those casual listeners who had their ears and eyes and minds and hearts closed to Yeshua and to His message would remain in their ignorance. He makes this point very clear. And you know Yeshua isn't the only one doing the sowing. We all should be sowing seed continuously everywhere we go. We should pray that God will prepare the hearts of those that we share the gospel with and that He would bring into our lives those that He has prepared. And God isn't necessarily preparing them all alone. <laughs> 
all who sow the seed of His Word can play a part in preparing people to receive it and understand it by helping them when they need help and then teaching them and explaining the things of God to them. But we don't need to soften the message and we don't need to oversimplify it to try to make it easier or more acceptable or more palatable because if a person is properly prepared, he or she will be more likely to understand God's message as it is presented in Scripture. And then His Holy Spirit will choose those who respond so they can be given more understanding of the message of the kingdom. Just as a seed only takes root in good soil that has been properly prepared, the message of the kingdom is understood only by those people who are prepared, who are ready for it, who are prepared to search for it and to dig beneath the surface and discover its meaning. Those who are chosen, they are the ones who will grasp and understand the message. But without the necessary preparation, the message of the kingdom is going to remain a mystery to them. Yeshua says in chapter 11, verse 25 of Matthew, that Father God hides things from the wise and the intelligent, meaning those who think they've got it all figured out on their own. Yet God reveals things to babes, to spiritual infants. Only soil that is prepared for seeds will produce a harvest. And only the heart that is spiritually prepared can receive Yeshua and understand the mysteries of the kingdom and then produce spiritual fruit. Those who won't receive Yeshua and His message can't understand spiritual things and the mysteries of the kingdom. It's similar to how God seems to harden some people's hearts. He's really hardening the hearts of those who have already hardened their own hearts. They've already chosen to resist Him stubbornly. But those who are genuinely and sincerely seeking God's truth and who accept and receive Yeshua as Messiah are enabled by the Holy Spirit to comprehend the meaning of Yeshua's parables. So it seems to me that everyone who has come to faith in Messiah has a really good reason to praise God and thank Him for preparing our hearts. He has opened our spiritual eyes and ears to see and hear and understand His truth. And this ought to bring us to our knees in worship and in thanks for the grace and mercy that He has given us that allows us to embrace Yeshua as our Messiah and our Savior. So, as we continue to study Yeshua's parables, let's remember that they have two purposes. Number one, they give additional revelation and understanding to those who are chosen because they have responded to Him and they are genuinely seeking His truth. And number two, they cause those who are not sincere and thus not chosen to remain in darkness at least until they humble themselves and repent and come to faith in Yeshua at which time God can begin giving them understanding. Yeshua's parables both reveal and hide at the same time. And those who respond to Him are given understanding and will be given more understanding. While those who do not respond to Him will lose what little understanding they had. Alright, let's go on now and look at the next parable which begins in verse 24. Matthew 13. Another parable He put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? From where then has it tares? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Do you want then that we go and gather them up? But he said, No. Lest while you gather up the tares, 
you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now this parable uses some of the same symbols as the first parable that we studied last week, the parable of the sower. It uses these symbols of sowing and seeds, the kingdom of heaven, things that interfere with growth, and an enemy that wants to sabotage the good growth. And it helps us to understand why. Even though the kingdom of God is to advance and grow by the power of God Himself through Messiah, why so many are rejecting His message. We're reminded that unbelief hampers the expansion of the kingdom. But we see once again that God invites all into His kingdom through His Son Yeshua. And even though we sow the seed, there are other forces at work trying to keep the seed from bearing fruit. In the parable of the sower, it was the rocky soil and the thorns and the birds that symbolized this interference with growth. And in this parable, it is the tares that are sown by the enemy. But both parables teach us that there will be a final harvest one day. The final victory of the kingdom is simply postponed until the day of judgment. Even though Yeshua, the king, initiated the kingdom at His first coming, it won't be fully realized and implemented and complete on the earth until He returns. It exists now at a spiritual level. But after He comes back and establishes His kingdom, it will literally and physically be here on the earth. Now after Yeshua tells this parable, He tells two more short parables before He explains this one to His disciples after they are alone, away from the crowd. So it's obvious again that not all were privileged to hear and understand and in this parable, he is teaching that temporarily the kingdom will seem to include both good and bad elements that are represented by the wheat and the tares. And this situation is not going to be rectified or resolved until the final harvest. Now Yeshua spoke frequently of the kingdom in the Gospels. Just what is the kingdom of heaven? Some people think, seem to think that it's heaven itself. The place where God is. And others think that it's on earth. Perhaps as a, a feeling of love and brotherhood between believers and church members. Seeking kumbaya. <laughs> it's interesting that many Christians don't really know too much about the kingdom of heaven. Let's begin by understanding that the word heaven in the phrase kingdom of heaven is not talking about the location. No. The word is used as a substitute, or if you want the theological term, a circumlocution <laughs> for the name of God. <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are exactly the same thing. Matthew is the only book in the Newer Testament that uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. The parallel passages in Mark and Luke say kingdom of God. But these two phrases mean the same thing. Now that might make you wonder, well, why did Matthew say it this way and the other said it the other way? Why did Matthew call it the kingdom of heaven? We need to remember that he was writing primarily to Jewish people. And Jewish people have an ancient tradition of never pronouncing God's actual name which I believe is Yehovah. Some believe Yahweh. There are other variations of that. One day we'll find out when Yeshua comes back. But the, the, the Jewish people, the more devout ones, believe that His name is just too sacred to pronounce. Partly out of reverence, but also largely out of fear of misusing His name and, and disobeying one of the commandments. So to be safe, they just don't say it at all. 
instead of saying his name, Yehovah, they will substitute titles like Adonai, which means Lord, or Hashem, which means the name. And even saying or writing the word God is irreverent to some of them. That's why you sometimes see the word God written with a dash in place of the O. That, that somehow they haven't all the way written it. <laughs> and that's why Matthew uses kingdom of heaven as a substitute for kingdom of God to avoid offending these Jewish people that he's writing to. So please realize that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God mean exactly the same thing. And it's talk, not talking about where it is or where we're going to spend eternity, but who it belongs to. Now, in verse 24, who is this man that sowed good seed in his field? Verse 27 says it's the, the householder or the landowner, depending on your translation. He's the owner of the house and the land. And in Yeshua's fuller explanation of the parable, he says in verse 37 that this owner is him. He identifies himself as the Son of Man in that verse, which almost always, at least in the book of Matthew, is a title that he uses of himself. And I believe he's relating to the use of the phrase Son of Man in Daniel's prophetic vision, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where it says that one like the Son of Man came before the Ancient of Days, God the Father, and was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. Yeshua means He's that Son of Man. He's the one who is sowing the seed in this parable. Verse 24 says the seed that He sows is good. It's pure. He sows no bad seed. And this makes a clear distinction between his work and the enemy's work. And there's a lesson for us right there. I need to make sure that my life is pure and that the message I sow is pure. That it's not mixed with bad seed. Sometimes people seem to think that they can add their own message or enhance the gospel somehow and make Yeshua's pure message, more successful. But you know, anything that we add to what Scripture says, got to be careful. We don't want to dilute the purity of God's Word. It's like adding bad seed to His good seed. Anything that is added to the message is like a different seed that produces something other than what the landowner wants. Yeshua's seed is the good seed. And we are to walk as He walked. We are to imitate Him. So we need to make sure that the seed we sow is like His and is not tainted. Many modern gospel tracts actually present a different gospel than what we see presented in Scripture by Yeshua and the apostles. Amen. Amen. The message of Yeshua and the apostles was not, God loves you. Jesus died for you, so say this little prayer for you and you'll go to heaven when you die. And that's not what they said. Now, there's, there's some truth in that, but that wasn't the message of the gospel of the kingdom. Their message was, repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what God commands. Verse 25 says that the enemy came while men slept. Now this doesn't have to mean that there was any laziness or complacency or neglect going on. They were just asleep like any farmers would be at night. In Yeshua's explanation in verse 39, He says this enemy is the devil. He is sinister and he works in darkness rather than in the light. Satan's kingdom is the kingdom of darkness. And he tries to ruin Yeshua's harvest by mixing bad seeds in with the good ones. We must never, ever forget that even though Yeshua ushered in the initial phase of the kingdom of God, it won't be fully established until His return. It is not yet a place of peace and unity. 
a battle is raging between the king and his enemy. I have a question for you. Are you engaged in that battle? Now, we're all affected by that battle. We're all involved in it to some extent. But are you really engaged in the battle? Are you hiding while others are fighting? Paul says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And so often, we get focused on this person or that person or that congregation or that fellowship or that ministry or that this ministry and, and what people are doing that we don't think they ought to do. But Paul says our real struggle is against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's a battle going on between God and His enemy. Between God's kingdom and the kingdom of darkness. Did you ever see one of those cartoons where there's a, somebody with an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other shoulder and the angel's trying to get the guy to do the right thing and the devil's trying to get him to be selfish? Well, you might say, Jan, that's not real. But you know what? There is an element of truth to that. There is. God does want us to do the right thing. But there is a devil named Satan. And he has his helpers. And they all want us to do the opposite of what God wants us to do. And wrong thoughts can come into our minds, sometimes from the demonic side. We are in a spiritual conflict. Now God's going to win, hallelujah. But for now, we are involved in expanding His kingdom and overcoming the kingdom of darkness. There is a battle raging. Now verse 25 says that the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. What in the world is a tear anyway? Thank you. <coughs> well, some Bible translations say weeds. But the Greek word here is more specific. It's not just a generic weed. The Greek word is zizanion. It's Strong's number 2215. And the modern English word for it is darnell. Okay, what in the world is a Darnell? Actually, there are several varieties of Darnell that grow as grass or weeds in the grain fields in Europe and Asia. And until the wheat gets ripe and turns brown, wheat and tares or Darnell look almost identical. The similarity is so great that in some regions, Darnell is referred to as False wheat or illegitimate wheat. There's another word they use. Starts with B. It's not really a vulgar word in some settings. It's really tough to distinguish the tares from the wheat before they get ripe. And if they're harvested together and grown up together and ground up together, rather, then the wheat is spoiled because the darnel can be infected with a fungus like poison. Eating it makes people dizzy and sick and it can even cause death. Now the fact that the wheat and the tares look so much alike makes the enemy's attack very effective. You know one of the most, devil's most effective strat strategies is producing counterfeits. And in this case, he imitates the owner sowing seed. And he did his dirty, wake, uh, his dirty work and went away. Like in guerrilla warfare. And there isn't even any evidence or awareness of his attack until much later when the crop begins to mature. No one knows for some time. And when that happens, when the crop does finally begin to mature, the results become visible and obvious. Now in the parable of the sower, it was the ability to bear fruit that resulted from seed being sown on good prepared soil. And when the wheat and the tares mature, they, they begin to look different. The wheat is brown with a large head of grain. And it's only when this fruit appears 
that the difference between them can be seen. And Yeshua says of His true followers, by their fruits you shall know them. Notice that after the wheat and tares have matured in verse 26, then in verse 27, the householder's servants came to him and, and they said to him, Hey boss, you did sow good seed, didn't you? Where'd these weeds come from? Do we ever speak to God that way? Do we ever question His activities? Do we ever wonder if if He did something that we thought He should have done? Hey God, did you or not? Do we ever wonder why we have some of the problems we have? Do we maybe try to blame Him for some of our difficulties that we experience? Do we ever think, God, if only You had done this or that, I wouldn't be having this trouble. Sometimes people struggle like this because of wrong expectations. We make the mistake of thinking that just because we have come into a relationship with God that our lives should now be peaceful and easygoing and free of problems, but that's not how it works. We shouldn't be surprised when things go wrong. We live in a fallen world and the kingdom of God is here at one level, but it's not yet complete. And yes, we have entered into the kingdom. But it will not be functioning and complete and operating at its ultimate full level until Yeshua returns. It's here now in a spiritual sense, but then it will be here literally and physically. Some people like to say, it's here already, but not yet. We have to be patient. We have to understand the circumstances. In this parable, it looks like something is wrong, but we know the owner did not sow bad seed. His seed is good. It just hasn't matured yet. It's still growing. And it will continue to grow until the harvest. And until then, there will be both good and bad on the earth affecting us and even in the kingdom. Just like the man's field had both wheat and tares. And this mystery is, is at the heart of this parable. The main point of this parable is to explain that even though, even though Yeshua did begin His kingdom, good and evil will continue to be mixed together even in the kingdom, in its present form. This has been a great stumbling block for the Jewish people for almost 2,000 years. Many, if not most of them, have misunderstood the prophecies of Scripture. They don't see that Messiah has to come twice to accomplish everything He is to do. And so most of them mistakenly believe that when their victorious leader Messiah comes for the first and only time, He will restore the kingdom in its full, mature, perfect sense. And then there will be no more wars. No more idolatry. The gathering together of all the exiles of Israel to the Holy Land. The restoration of all things. And the worldwide recognition of the God of Israel as the one and only true God. Those are the things Messiah is supposed to accomplish. They don't understand that He comes twice. Once to die as the suffering servant for our sins, and a second time to do all those other things. And the fact that all these things didn't happen during Yeshua's lifetime is seen and interpreted and understood as, as evidence that this man Yeshua, who was widely rejected in Bible times, why well, he just couldn't have been their long-awaited Messiah. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. For them, it's, it's only when the full manifestation of the kingdom of God is restored and Israel takes its place of prominence again and it's established in peace 
That's when the Messiah can be officially recognized because that's what he is expected and required to do according to the prophets. They just don't see that the kingdom has come, but not yet in the way they expected it. In this parable, Yeshua shows that the fullness of the kingdom won't come until the final harvest. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason that we still have wars. There's a reason that we still have idolatry. There's a reason that we still have exile and blindness to God, even though His kingdom has begun. There's a reason that there are tares mixed in with the wheat. And Yeshua tells that reason in Verse 28, an enemy has done this. The tares aren't there because the owner's seed was bad. It's because an enemy is working hard against him by planting bad seeds in the same field, mixing the bad with the good. And when the servants go to him and offer to gather them up, he says, no, no, you, you can't take the tares without taking the wheat too. By the time they have matured enough that you can tell them apart, at first, they're so thoroughly mixed and intertwined and tangled up that to try to pull up the tares before the harvest would damage the wheat. So to keep from damaging the wheat, he says in verse 30, to just let them both grow together until the harvest. After they have matured, it will be easier to tell them apart and separate them. The tares will be burned while the wheat goes into his barn. This happens when Yeshua returns in judgment on the world and to establish his kingdom. This dilemma of evil coexisting with good will finally be dealt with. Now just in case you haven't identified all the symbolism in this parable, the one sowing the seed is Yeshua. We talked about that. The field is the world and the, and the kingdom of God in this world. The good seed that grows up to be the wheat, that represents God's people who genuinely belong in the kingdom. The tares are those who are under the influence and control of the enemy, the devil. The harvest is the day of judgment. And the servants who reap the harvest are the angels. Now notice that the symbolism in this parable does not necessarily line up with the symbolism in other parables. We need to remember as we're reading and, and understanding parables that certain things or animals or birds or types of people can represent different things in different parables. So don't get locked into saying birds always mean that or this always means this. For example, in the parable of the sower, the seed was the Word of God. But in this parable, it represents people. We can get ourselves into some interpretation problems if we insist that these symbols always represent the same thing in different Bible passages. We need to allow the context to give us the meaning. And there's one thing I want us to understand from this parable. One thing that it can mean to us as believers in faith communities and congregations and fellowships like this one. We are in a field where both good and bad seed are both sown. And until Yeshua returns, there will be a mixture of both good and evil people. Perhaps both genuine and counterfeit disciples. Coexisting in the kingdom of God. We should expect to find some people who appear at times to be genuine disciples that really are not. They'll turn out to be imposters in the end. And the deciding factor is, once again, what? The fruit. The 
words are cheap. Anybody can say, I'm one of you. I believe the same thing you do. It's, it's, it's our actions and our obedience that counts. And we need to realize that these imposters may not always be aware that they're imposters. They, they may not always know that they aren't genuine disciples. I'm reminded of the words that Yeshua will speak on Judgment Day to some who presumed that they would be entering into His kingdom because of their religious activities, but to their surprise, they are rejected by Him. In Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 20, the Bible says, Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, what's going on? Haven't we prophesied in your name? Didn't we cast out devils in your name? Didn't we do all these wonderful works in your name? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. He says in verse 21 that only those who do God's will shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 23 that He will send away those that work iniquity. And the Greek word for iniquity here is anomia. Strong's number 458. And the literal meaning of that word is violation of the law or lawlessness. Yeshua seems to be saying that those who live in lawlessness without the law, without the Torah, may just have a real serious problem on Judgment Day, even if they've been prophesying and doing wonderful works and casting out devils in His name. According to Yeshua, only he or she that does the will of His Father will enter into the kingdom of heaven. In other words, if you're not doing the will of His Father in heaven, then you're not going to enter into the kingdom. That's what Yeshua says. Doing the will of the Father is the proof or the fruit of who we are in Him. And it's not only obeying the, the God's commandments, including the commandments about the Sabbath and, and the feasts and our diet, but it's also His commandments about loving our neighbor as ourselves, assisting others who need help to meet their needs, especially the basic needs of food, drink, clothing, and shelter. That's how we bear fruit in our lives, by obeying God in all of these areas. All of them. And that, that's how we glorify Him, by the things that we do and say every day in every way that we can. But until the harvest, until the harvest, the genuine disciples and the counterfeit impostors will have to coexist in the kingdom. <coughs> and that's a situation we just have to be patient with and tolerate. At least to some extent. Now, of course, we are to rebuke evil and blatant sin, and the Bible gives us a procedure for confronting, and if necessary, rejecting those who refuse to repent of observable, deliberate sin in their lives. But don't you know that many people tend to put their best foot forward and keep their sins hidden from true believers? Nobody wants to expose their dark side to the people of God. And when we're not sure about someone, we just have to give them the benefit of the doubt. But we can find comfort and encouragement in the knowledge that one day there will be a separation and the tares will be burned while the wheat goes to the barn. Some people will go to everlasting punishment while others will go to eternal life. So let's not be discouraged because things will be made right in the end. Now there's a number of things being taught here that we need to remember. First, let's remember that the devil 
will sow tares in the same field where the good seed is planted. It's important that we know this. We absolutely must expect it. Now, we don't want to be suspicious of everyone, but we must expect counterfeit impostors among us from time to time who are planted to cause problems, whether they know it or not. We've experienced that here. If we want to combat Satan's evil schemes, we'll need to all be diligent to look for good, genuine fruit in people's lives and not just sweet words and smiles and bubbly personalities. We need to observe good, genuine fruit before we entrust someone with roles and responsibilities that could affect an entire congregation or fellowship. We've been there too. The final judgment of our fruit doesn't take place until the day of judgment. But there should be some observable evidence of the good fruit of genuine disciples before then. But you know what? The fact that Yeshua used Darnell tares to represent those who are sown by the devil should remind us that these counterfeit believers will look so much like true believers that it can be extremely difficult to tell the difference. And it may take some time to be able to correctly identify them and their character. So we've got to be patient. But at the same time, we don't want to be complacent. Look at verse 31. Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches there. So in this parable, we have the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God compared to the tiny, teeny, tiny, little, bitty. Why don't we raise our voice when we say that? <laughs> a little tiny mustard seed growing up into a, a tree big enough for birds to come rest in. Now, Yeshua doesn't give any interpretation to this parable, so we might ask, is Yeshua's point that this particular little mustard seed grows up into something bigger than it ordinarily would? Or is He simply emphasizing the fact that tiny mustard seeds become much larger plants or trees? That's a legitimate question. I believe it's the latter since mustard bushes or trees in the Middle East and in Africa, they're different than what we have in this country, they can grow up to 20 feet high. Wow. Yeshua is contrasting the smallness of the mustard seed to the tree that comes from it. And the kingdom of God is like that. Yeshua is going to tell His disciples in chapter 17, verse 20, that if they only had the faith like a mustard seed, they and we could accomplish great things. He says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove from here to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Yeshua tells this parable to teach that like a mustard seed, which was commonly used in those times to designate something ex extremely small. Little bitty. <laughs> the kingdom of God on the earth, which Yeshua was initiating, would start out very small, but one day it will culminate in something grand and glorious. This is true of the kingdom because it's true of the King Himself. He humbled Himself from a place in heaven to come to earth first as a mortal baby human. 
But He's going to return one day as the King of Kings to whom every knee will bow. Yes. And in the same way, the kingdom He rules and reigns over began without fanfare among the common folk of Israel before growing to encompass the whole world one day. Yeshua taught that the kingdom would start out small for another reason, to bolster the, the faith and the hope of His disciples. He doesn't want them or us to get discouraged while we see the gospel message being received by some, but rejected by others. And He doesn't want them or us to lose heart when counterfeit believers are found to be planted among His true disciples. The kingdom's going to grow. And it will be victorious in the end because the seed was good. The end is in the beginning. The Jewish people knew that the kingdom of God would be glorious and that it would be triumphant one day, but they just didn't seem to realize that the kingdom would have such a small beginning. So this parable was given to make it clear that this was the case and that it was Father's plan from the beginning.